Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for the speakers we've had this morning. It's certainly been very informative. Um, today, I'll be giving you an overview of some of the projects that C5 have been doing in the IoT space. So we'll be running through bus tracker, car parking spaces, air quality sensors, garden tags, and then finishing off on a bit of big data. I suppose primarily this was aimed for everyone, but I guess just to single out someone like Dan, I guess the message from this presentation will be keep picking on Barcelona. We're hopefully doing it a little bit better. So, Bus Tracker. Bus Tracker provides a near real-time view of the bus's location in Jersey on m.gov.je. As you can see here, the buses are all moving around. It makes it very easy if you quickly want to dash out at the last minute and grab your bus stop. What we can also do is aggregate the data. So in this example, I've clicked on a bus stop rather than tracking an individual bus. And I can see the individual routes that are both going to be passing that stop on the way to my destination. You can pick different sides of the road. And obviously, in this example, we've got Route 15. But it would aggregate all the different routes together. The way we do this is by picking up the GPS data from each of the buses. We enrich it with the timetable information so that we can give you a pretty accurate estimate of what time the bus will arrive. For our first two ETAs there, the four minutes and the 33 minutes, that's driven by the actual GPS data. So is the bus stuck in traffic? Is it on its way? For the one further down, the 59 minutes there, that's just taken from the timetable information because the bus hasn't left the depot, hasn't started its journey, so we can aggregate that together. So how does it work? We use the 3G connectors on the buses along with the GPS to pull that information and we push it up to a service bus. For most of the IoT type things we've been doing recently, we tend to prefer that technology. We store it to do long-term trend analysis, and we also distribute it via JSON to be visible on m.gov.je. The benefit of storing it is it means we can then have a look at how the buses are performing, are they meeting SLAs, and we can also start doing a bit more of the clever analytics of starting to say the bus timetable is a very static thing, but we know that you know, traffic in the mornings and in the evenings, it's going to slow the buses down. So we might as well adjust the timetable to sort of reflect those patterns. As this builds up the data set, the more data we get, the more accurate we can be. If you don't fancy catching the bus and would prefer to drive in, you'll need somewhere to park, which leads us nicely on to the parking spaces available on gov.je. As you can see here, We've got a pretty good indication of how many spaces are available, the car parks, and where they are. And it's all pretty much green, which means there's plenty of space available. This is all driven off the counters at the entrance and the exit to the car parks, all feeding up. The green color tells us that there's lots of space available, and that will gradually go into sort of an amber and a red as different percentages are used up. We can also enhance this to say, well, maybe you know, Pier Road is having some maintenance done, there's less space available, we can reduce that limit and sort of display a warning to you sooner. So when you start your drive in, you already have a pretty good idea of where you're gonna park when you get there. So we've got our various car parks across the top. Uh, they are all feeding onto a server that's on an internal network. So now that's going straight up into the service bus. Uh, I believe the guys were calling it the IoT gateway, where we do a little bit of processing there before pushing it up. As we roll this out to some other car parks, we'll just start pushing the data direct to the service bus. We then effectively bring it all together under the SOJ public data, which is hopefully where all of this sort of IoT data can go and sort of really enhance that ability for lots of companies in Jersey to access it and make the best use of it that we can. Uh, we then bring it through, enrich it, and display it on the website, ready for you guys to use. Any issues, we also automatically log that into our ticketing system so we can keep track of how the system is working and that it's all performing as expected. Air quality. 
So air quality is something that we've been looking at in partnership with Digital Jersey, and it effectively is to place a load of sensors across the island. We currently are looking into temperature, humidity, and NO2, effectively vehicle emissions. What that allows us to do is sort of put all of this data together and effectively what we would ideally like to do is provide it to you guys so that you can play around with the data and start looking into some of the interesting things that Dan referred to before. The main way that this is put together is our sensors are using the LoRaWAN network that JT have put together. So this is a long range wide area network designed specifically for IoT to connect together and as a low power bi-directional communication with end-to-end -end security and mobility designed in the core of it. JT have rolled this out across the island so it's available for all of us to go and use and have a play with. That data gets uploaded into our management layer and then through to Decent Labs. They're the people that have generated the hardware uh, and it automatically feeds into their platform. We then use some Python and a bit of machine learning to try and pull that data out. So the problem with a lot of these sensors is the accuracy. You know, you can get very odd readings, things that don't basically indicate what the long-term trend actually is. So we use a bit of machine learning just to help smooth that data out and give us something of a bit more of a consistent picture of what we're looking for. Once we've done that, we then just push the data up into JSON. At the moment, it's flowing onto a dashboard, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to make that available to all of you guys soon, and you can have a play and see what you think. So onto garden tags is quite a nice real world example uh, of what you can start doing once you're getting all of this data. So it's not a true IoT in the aspect that it's using a mobile phone and depending on your definition, IoT may or may not fall under the mobile phone world, uh, but does lead us nicely onto what we can do with big data. So what is garden tags? Garden tags is a planting advice and inspiration from other gardeners all pulled together you get free plant identification and plant care tasks, and you get a community of like-minded individuals and forming a massive planting encyclopedia. What I'm obviously gonna focus on is the plant identification, so image upload and categorization. Maybe you have a plant at home, or maybe you've seen someone else's plants, and you just think, hmm, I wonder what that plant is. It might be a question that's crossed your mind, and now you can find the answer. So what we can do is we can effectively train what we have here as a neural network, and we can train it. So we give it an image, which is a daffodil in this example. We tell it that it's a daffodil. We pass it through the network, and it effectively starts to say, I understand that that image is a daffodil. What we start to do with that is we build it and build it, and as many pictures of daffodils as you can find, and at this point, you're training it, so you're telling it that it's a daffodil. It's not having to figure it out or do anything clever. It's just looking at various things. So maybe one of the layers is looking at the shape of the petals. Another layer might be looking at the colors. And it effectively starts bringing all of this information together to understand what a label is. Obviously, this is a very simple example. As you add in different plant types and start growing what the image processing can do, then it will really will expand out. So once we've run through as many daffodils as we can, then we can start using this for real. So we can go out, take a photo of a daffodil, run it through, and get effectively a list of estimates. So what we've done here is we've used 1,020 daffodil images, so not a very massive amount. And in a couple of minutes on a laptop, crunched out that we know the image on the left with 16% accuracy is definitely a daffodil. We've also brought in all these additional plants that it might be, because image categorization is not an exact sort of science at this point. And we've also used a very small data set. As we roll this out into production and moving it onto into the cloud, we're effectively starting to look at you know, 100,000, 200,000 images of daffodils, and that obviously greatly increases the accuracy. How does that work for garden tags as an end user who just wants to get on with it? They can take a picture of the plant, upload it, we provide the recommendation, we list it in what we think is the correct order based on the estimates, and they have the option to confirm that choice, which is great for us because it provides a feedback loop, which means we can retrain the model on a larger data set in the future, or they can actually turn it down and say, you know, no, the model was wrong, and we can feed that back in as well. 
So gradually, the longer it's out there, the more it learns, the more data we have, which is perfectly accessible. So to finish off with, we'll head towards big data, which I think is something that covers off what all the IoT devices are doing quite nicely. So, a few stats for you. We've created more data in the last few years than the entire span of human history, which based on what we've been seeing this morning doesn't surprise me with all of these jet engines and everything else going around. Less than 1% of the generated data has actually been analyzed. So a lot of the answers we think we're looking for, we may have already captured the underlying data for, but just haven't actually looked at it yet. And finally, analysis of that data can uncover new patterns or enhance existing efficiencies in what we already know. So what happens when you just go digging? You find some pretty random stats. So men who skip breakfast are at greater risk of coronary heart disease. So I hope you're tucked in this morning before you came out here. Users of Chrome and Firefox make better employees. I don't think that they've held back from telling us that. Uh, tapping with proper capitalization indicates credit worthiness. Interesting. And female named hurricanes are more deadly. <laughs> so what's important? It's true. Yeah. <laughs> so what's important to know is just because these relationships exist doesn't mean it will happen. And certainly, just because you've gone and found it in the data doesn't make it right. So, <coughs> sorry. so what we go looking for effectively is in this data, it's up to us to challenge what we get out of this, because machines will tell us one thing, but it's up to us to truly understand what they're actually trying to say. Thank you very much. Thank you.